You may be seated. Great job, worship team. Man, that came off. All right. I'm doing double duty today. Had to go check on my friend, Pastor Joe. Uh, he's still alive, I think. Judging by the whimperings, I'm pretty sure he's still with us. Now, uh, my friend Cade back there stepping up and running the sound. How about a big round of applause for him? I absolutely love it when, uh, when, we're, when we're thinned out because we're spread out. It's such an awesome problem to have. So that, that is discipleship. So we have opportunities to get out and to serve in other ways, whether it be through concerts or music ministry or uh, pulpit supply, all those types of things. Uh, I just celebrate that. It's such a huge, huge victory for the kingdom. Um, we have this Sunday and next Sunday are our last Sundays in Ephesians. We've study through the entire book of Ephesians. If you miss any of those messages, they are on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to our website, SevilleChurch.com, and look at all of those. Uh, then we'll take a uh, small reprieve and do some topical studies and then uh, jump into our next book. So looking forward to that. But uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 20 will be our focus scripture today. I'm going to share that with you. And then we will, um, I'll come back, we'll add some context, and we'll just uh, see what Paul is telling us here. But let me share that with you. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 13, says this, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up your shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all power and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. May the Lord add his blessing to the scripture reading uh, we're going to uh, dive into that uh, just a verse at a time, but this is Paul writing a letter to the first century church and us about how we are to live as imitators of God. How, how does one live the Christian life? Well, Paul is telling us how to live the Christian life. Now, you remember he spent a considerable amount of time looking at those really, really important relationships, husbands and wives, parents and children, Masters and bond servants or employees and employers or leaderships and leader, leaders and followers. And then uh, last week we switched gears a little bit. That's how we are to live amongst one another. Now how do we live amongst the world? And his response, you better wear some armor. You, you better have some armor on. You want to be a Christian and you want to live the Christian life? You want to follow Jesus and be an imitator? which there is no not imitator. That's what following Jesus is, is you are called to build the kingdom. It doesn't matter if you're a gifted speaker or a musician. We are all called to build the kingdom. God didn't gift you so you could make a company millions of dollars, though you can use your gifts that way. That's not wrong, but you're primarily given that gift so that you could be a light to an otherwise dark world. 
And Paul reiterates that and reminds us of that. And then he tells us, uh, well, Christian, you're going to live in this world. You're going to need some armor. You need to put on the whole armor of God. Now, Paul, I, I got into that last week about putting on the armor of God, the call to put on the armor of God. Today, Paul's going to expound on that very idea of putting on the armor of God. What is he talking about and what does that mean? Let's look at it a verse at a time. We'll start with verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, the e- uh, withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Therefore, that is in light of the schemes of the devil. Last week we talked about the schemes of the devil. Methodoia is the Greek word. It's where we get the word method. It's the methods of the devil. We looked at those, uh, those uh, words of doubt. Those, did God really say, those twistings of what we know to be true. Those are the schemes that Paul is still talking about. Therefore, in light of that, he says, put on the whole armor of God, all of it. Not wearing a portion of the armor makes it all useless. Paul is making an illustration of what's very common. If you looked out into the Roman landscape, remember he's in a prison, and he would see Roman guards that would have their battle dress on, they would have their armor on, and he's taking what's common to the people, and he's giving us an example that we may better understand what's required of us. And he says that you may be able, so this, this armor is necessary. It's not option. It's not optional. There's sometimes there's equipment that, that is optional, and it can protect you, and it can increase your chances of not being injured. I, I, I think back to my uh, life as a mechanic, and I remember uh, big safety pushes, and, and one of these uh, times where um, there was a yellow line painted on the shop floor, and if you were to go out into the shop floor, you had to have safety glasses on. Had to. You had to have safety glasses on, and you had to have steel-toed boots uh, to go out into the shop floor. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I broke the rules. Sometimes I had to run out to the shop and speak with somebody or do something, and I did not put my safety glasses on. And I'm here to tell you, I still have both my eyes. My equipment may have saved me. God forbid something would have flown off a lathe or uh, blown apart at the right time. I, I could have been seriously injured. That kind of equipment is kind of optional. You wear it because uh, it'll increase your likelihood of not being injured. That, that's one kind of equipment. Then there's another kind of equipment like a scuba tank. If you're going to spend an hour on the bottom of the ocean floor, um, it would be a good idea to have some type of breathing apparatus or, or a scuba tank. That equipment is not optional. Do you see the difference? If I'm going to explore the coral reef and I'm going to stay in the water for any amount of time, minutes, hours, then I better have this essential equipment. It is necessary. This armor that Paul is talking about is like that. It's not optional. It's not like the safety glasses in a shop. They might protect you if something were to happen. No, no, no. It's the type of equipment that's absolutely necessary if you are to withstand the schemes or the methods of the enemy. That's what he's saying here. And he says, in the evil day. What he's talking about there is there's going to be times where you have this armor on and you're like, you know, it's kind of warm. Things seem okay. I probably don't need it, but but, but you need to have it on because the the enemy is relentless. He he doesn't stop. He's hoping you'll just take that armor off and uh, that's when he's going to move in. Not with something absurd and something completely wrong, but something worse, something that's almost right. Almost right is worse than completely wrong. Police officers wear a bulletproof vest almost all the time they're on duty. Why do they wear it all the time? 
so that they're always prepared. That's the idea here. The devil and his angels, they're strong, but they're not omnipotent or omnipotent. That's to be super, super strong. They're not omnipotent like God is. Uh, They can't withstand against the armor. After the Christian is strengthened in the Lord by putting on the full armor of God, then we are able to stand fast or withstand or resist against the evil powers. Let's look at the next verse, verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the belt of truth um, is interesting there. Now a Roman soldier would put on his armor, and he, he would have a belt or a sash that he would put on first, and all that belt or that sash would be the centerpiece for all the other garments. This had to fit right. It refers to the belt of truth. Paul is referring to this object of objective truth of the gospel. He's saying the good news of the gospel and that truth, it's not subjective, it's objective. It's true whether you believe it or not. That is the foundation of our armor. Truth is the very foundation of our armor, and Paul's getting at that. It's super important. Not your feelings, not your perspective, not your worldview, not your opinion. Objective truth. That is the belt of our armor. I remember in the military going to get fitted for uniforms. And it was interesting because they had a lot of people and they had a lot of lines and they had a lot of things going on there. And they didn't really care what your opinion was. He said, I think I'm a, I probably need a large, and they, they didn't ask your opinion. They'd say, no, no, this is what you need because this is what fits. If I don't like to fit it. I like, a, I like it a little more baggy. They'd say, they didn't ask you that. <laughs> it wasn't up to you. It basically, it fit this way. Everything rides on this belt of truth. I remember having a uh, pair of shorts. My wife and I were um, on a trip and uh, I brought some shorts, and I knew the shorts were too big, but I brought them anyway. They were the only golf shorts that I had. And so we went to the pro shop because we, we were going to golf. And I got a belt, but they didn't have a belt that was quite small enough for me. And I like to think I'm bigger than I actually am. Uh, so I bought this belt anyway, knowing that that's probably a, an inch or two too big for me. And I, and I put it on, and the whole time I'm golfing, i got to swing my club and then pull my pants up. And swing my club and, and pull my pants up and hold my pants up, trying to look cool in front of my wife still. It was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. I, I look like a fool. Can you imagine living in a world where truth is subjective? And how you feel about it is the most important thing? How ridiculous is that? living in that world where where truth no longer matters it's how i feel about something how i identify as something my opinion of something and we look worse than me trying to hold my pants up on the golf course like a proper fitting belt a soldier's belt or the stat the sash gave ease and freedom of movement. Man, when you got a, we got a belt on and things work right, and, or you got a tool belt or, or, or some type of equipment belt, man, when that thing fits right, you can run, you can move, you can bend over, you can climb ladders, you can go wherever you want. Freedom is from truth. When you wear the belt of truth, you have that kind of freedom to move around in this world. What a great visual Paul uses. And then he says, breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects our heart, our vital organs. He's talking about this idea of sanctification. Now, when you become a believer, uh, you are sanctified instantaneously. Sanctified is just a, a real fancy word to mean set apart. It's 
what holy means. So when you become a believer in Christ, you are automatically and instantaneously sanctified. You are set apart for God. However, he's not done changing you. So even though that you are instantaneously set apart, you are a work in progress. How many of you are a work in progress? Yeah. Yeah, all of us. We're all a work in progress. So we're followers of Christ. We have been set apart. But we all know that uh, he's not finished with me yet. And there's still a lot of work to do in my heart, in my life. And, and um, because of that, I need to protect my vitals. I need to protect my heart. I need to protect the things that if we're damaged would lead to death. We don't have to put ourselves in positions where we are prone to fail. Listen to me, Christian. There is a common misconception that we need to go everywhere and do everything and we're to witness to everybody and we're to fix all people. But let me tell you, we don't have to put ourselves in positions where we are prone to fail. For you, well, that may be a place. That may be a place for you. I, I can't go there because fill in the blank. I quit drinking 10 years ago, and I know if I go to that Christmas party, I know if I go to that family reunion, I know if I go to that place with those people, my vitals are going to be wounded. Well, Christian, for you, your breastplate is not going. Maybe that's a person for you. Maybe that's a person for you to, to protect your vitals, to be sanctified. Hey, I, I can't be around that person. I want to love them, but every time I'm with them, I just find myself sinning because I just can't stand to be around them. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, I harbor wounds or unforgiveness or whatever it is. Maybe your breastplate is cutting that person a wide path. Maybe it's a habit for you. Maybe you wearing the breastplate of righteousness is stopping whatever it is that's tearing your family apart. Maybe what your eyes are taking in. Barnapol recently suggests that pornography is so prevalent in society it's spilled its way into the church. The children today at eight years old are exposed to pornographic material. It's prevalent. We would be fools to think it wasn't taking place inside the kingdom as well. Maybe that's a habit that you need to gird against and you need to put a breastplate of righteousness on. Maybe it's your identity. Whatever somebody projected on you and told you that you ought to be this or you are this or you are what you were, Maybe your breastplate is reminding yourself that you don't have to identify that way anymore. That Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross so you could be his. And that's your identity. Believers are set apart. They're sanctified. That's instant and ongoing. We guard our hearts. Let's look at the next verse, verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. I remember when high tops were a big deal. I played basketball for a year or two in middle school and, and realized I was completely horrible at it. Um, but I remember these shoes that came out. Perhaps you remember them. In the 80s, they were super popular. They were high tops. They weren't just any high tops. They had a pump in the tongue of the shoe. Yes, amen, right? You still got them. It was like a little basketball in the tongue of the shoe. And when you pumped it up, it actually inflated something in your shoe. And I had to have those shoes. If you didn't have those shoes, you couldn't jump very high. You couldn't run very fast. You couldn't do most things. You could hardly function unless you had those shoes. Or at least that's how they were, they were marketed that way. I remember needing those shoes. The idea here isn't necessarily anything to do with the proper footwear. The idea there is sure-footedness. Sure-footedness. Being confident in your shoes. You're ready. 
to go. And certainly shoes are important in different athletics. Obviously, you don't want to wear cleats on the wrestling mat. That, that wouldn't help you at all, right? You don't want to wear uh, golf spikes when you're playing basketball. That would, that would do the opposite. So, so there's this idea of being confident that you're ready to go. That's what Paul is talking about. And, and the only thing I can liken that uh, of recent years is work boots. Work boots make a difference. Right? Having the proper uh, attire on your feet is a big deal. Like if, if you do work in a shop environment, uh, you probably don't want to be walking around in your Jesus sandals or your Birkenstocks or your flip-flops, right? Where they're welding and cutting steel and all kinds of stuff. That would be silly. You wouldn't be prepared for the task at hand. And that's what Paul is getting at. It's like, hey, make sure that you are sure-footed, that you are confident in your equipment from what? What gives us that confidence? The gospel. The gospel. That we know how this story ends. And Paul is saying the idea here is being ready and sure-footedness from the gospel, knowing the gospel. That's That's like your shoes that you can put a whole lot of confidence in. It also gives, in the context here, uh, Paul's going to get to, it involves carrying the, the attack into the enemy, um, which is clearly to adopt an offensive stance. So, so we're donning this, this armor, and our feet don't turn into cement. Rather, we don the proper foot attire. That's so we can move, so we can bring the offense to the enemy. I don't know if you knew this or not, but theologically speaking, this isn't our home. Theologically speaking, the world is broke and it don't work right. Biblically th- speaking and theologically speaking, you ain't going to make it better. I, I know it's very, uh, maybe a pessimistic view and if you are uh, just full of goodness and, and you think you can make a difference in the world, that's awesome and I applaud that and you should be an encourager, uh, but you're not going to fix this brokenness. You're not. The Bible says it's going to remain broken until it's gone, until it's new, until Christ comes back. So, you are on enemy territory. You're not just behind enemy lines, Christian. You're like taking residence at their camp, in their barracks. Like, like you're here behind enemy lines. That's the visual Paul is giving us. And make sure you're sure-footed because of the truth of the gospel. If you don't know that, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about that. We are prepared to announce the gospel to the entire world and engage in spiritual warfare. Let's look at verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Was pretty neat <clears throat> if you've ever, raise your hand, have you ever heard this thing like how often do you uh, think about the Roman Empire, that question that's going around? Raise your hand if you've heard that. So I, I was asked that the other day before I knew this was like some kind of weird uh, social media craze, basically that, that women are floored at the amount of times men think about the Roman Empire. And I was asked this by a, a lady. She said, how often do you think of the Roman Empire? And I said, like, I don't know three, four times a day? I mean, isn't that normal? Don't, don't you do that? I mean, how do you not drive on the roads and, and think of the Roman Empire or uh, the, the sewage system that, that's under your feet, all that kind of stuff? Maybe, maybe I'm just weird, uh, but I, I think about the Roman Empire and I think about their ability to fight and why they were such a good empire. And this verse 16 talks about taking up the shield of faith. Well, if you knew one of the streak secrets to the Roman strength was their shields. It, it wasn't their weapons of destruction. It was their weapons of defense. The, the Romans were masters with the shield. They would actually band together. Everybody would have these large shields, and they would band together, and they would form a wall, impenetrable wall. And then the guys in the second row would lift their shields up, and they would protect them from the flaming darts that were flying overhead. They were a tank. They literally turned into it. Was a, it was a mobile army, but with their shields, they were almost unstoppable. 
like, like they were like little tanks in formation when they got together and they would just conquer places. The Romans were superior in their shield strategy. <clears throat> Listen, Christians come together, we create an impenetrable wall. The enemy and his darts are fruitless against. This is why it's important to assemble. That's why we get together. We don't get together because we think, well, we need to strengthen God's army. No, we get together so we can put our shields together and we can deflect some of the nonsense that we just had to put up with Monday through Saturday. And we get here and we put our shields together and we are thwarting the enemy's attacks and banding together. It's a pretty awesome word picture. It's a pretty awesome visualization that Paul is giving us. To take the shield of faith then is to appropriate the promises of God on our behalf. We're confident that he will protect us in the midst of the battle. We put our faith in that shield and in that structure. Let's look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Take means to, to receive, to grab it, to go get it. And the helmet gives us a sense of security. That we're safe from the schemes of the evil one. As we appropriate salvation, that means we apply it to ourselves more fully, and we live in the light of everything that Christ has done, then we have every reason to be confident of the outcome of the battle. The sword of the Spirit is referring to an offensive weapon. Swords are offensive, not defensive. And likely Paul has in mind a shorter sword, not some big Excalibur sword, but a shorter sword that uh, could be wielded quickly and light and uh, do a lot of damage as an offensive weapon. So we have our armor, we have our shield, we have our sword, and we're ready to go in, and we're able to inflict damages to the enemy whenever possible. See, the type of fighting that we do is close, hand-to-hand. -hand. It's wrestling. We talked about that last week. It's intimate. It's, it's personal. And so when we're in close and personal, we need some type of weapon to give to the enemy. So we use a sword of the Spirit or God's Word. That's what Paul is talking about. There's two words <clears throat> in the Greek for word. There's logos, which refers to God's word often. And then there's rhema. Rhema is used here, and it's, it's, it's more to do with the spoken or the proclaimed word. It definitely applies to God's written word, the Bible, but it, it more applies to the spoken word. Say the right things at the right time to the right people. If this is true... And it is the power to penetrate and inflict damage to the enemy is given by the Spirit. Now, what is not in view here is some type of ad hoc word that we can say and all of a sudden Satan runs away scurrying in terror, right? This name it and claim it stuff that you see on TV a lot. This, this is not Harry Potter, okay? Biblical truth isn't some majestical, magical thing. You can't say some spell or cast something like that. Words have power because the meaning behind the word, the intent behind the word gives the word the power. The intent and the thing behind this word is the Spirit of God. This is the faithful speaking of the gospel. In the realm of darkness, Paul talked about being children of light to illuminate the world of darkness around us. And this is liberating to the person that hears. Wouldn't it be nice if we just get a big chunk of land somewhere and build up big walls and we say, you know what, we're already saved. Let's just hunker down right here, and we can, we can you know, the, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. We'll let them. We'll just hang out over here. We'll hold everything in common. We'll share everything, and everybody will work, and everybody will eat, and it'll be just wonderful. 
That would be awesome. But then we neglect this. That you speaking the gospel may cause somebody to be freed in their bondage of Satan. That's your job, to free the captives. You go out and you proclaim the gospel not only for yourself and be reminded of yourself, but because God chose to illuminate the otherwise unknowing world through you. He revealed himself through you. So you could put the good news to your feet and take it out into the world. Let's look at verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all power and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Again, making supplication for, for all saints. We say the gospel we remind ourselves of the gospel, not only for ourselves and the reminder there, but to uh, loose the captives as well. Prayer is given the greater prominence within the context of this battle. It's, it's higher than any other weapon. This is our strongest, most important weapon is prayer and supplication. A life dependent on God in prayer is essential. If we are to gauge, <clears throat> engage successfully in this warfare with the powers of darkness, we have to understand this. Let me finish up our, our scripture here. 19 and 20 says this. Paul says, And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> I just love this. Paul is saying, listen, prayer is so important. How important? It's everything. It's everything. It's everything. It's everything, Christian. Prayer is everything. And by the way, pray for me. Let me tell you about Paul. Paul went to be from the biggest persecutor of the faith to the biggest evangelical the world has ever known. He's literally writing this because he was arrested and put in prison. Why? For proclaiming that Jesus is who he says he is. And he needs prayer. He asked his people, the followers of Christ, to pray for him as well. How important is that? He desires that in the midst of his imprisonment, that he may be given utterance to proclaim the good news. He's not saying, <clears throat> hey, um, could you pray for me? Uh, the, the lunch here is really, really bad, and I'm wrongly accused, uh, and it's just very terrible. Uh, I've been put in prison against my will, and it's just this terrible travesty of justice. He doesn't say that. He said, man, my life stinks right now. Would you pray that I'm able to continue God's mission? And how, in, how encouraging is that? He's not saying, hey, would you pray to get me out of here? W would, you, would you help me get out of this? Would you bust the chains? He's coveting their prayers. He's asking for their prayers. And his prayer is, hey, would you um, pray that I stay strong and I continue to preach the gospel in the midst of all this darkness to these Roman guards that are guarding me? Maybe they would come to know Jesus because I had the strength and the courage to, to deliver the gospel. Is that how we pray for each other, folks? Do we do that? How is your prayer life? I'm asking you to really reflect on this. How is your prayer life? If you're like me, you get distracted. If you're like me, you get too busy. If you're like me, maybe you, maybe you, you cry out to God when it's a cry. If you're like me, that, that's when you go and you rub the lamp and, and try to get God to answer your prayers or just hear your voice because somebody got sick or finances are running low or you're having relational issues with somebody in your life. It ought not be. We should wear the armor of God all the time. When we come together and pray for one another, we should lift up each other in prayer. So I want to take a little bit of time today. We have five minutes left of the service. This is what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, when I say go, I want you to get up and I want you to sit by somebody that you don't really know. Okay? 
It's okay. This is a safe place. And I'm going to have you ask a question. You're going to take turns. This is a partnership. I want you to do this. Sit next to that person who's a believer and say, how can I pray for you? What's one thing I can pray for you right now? And you don't know them. You don't have to. You don't have to know their situation. You don't have to know anything about their circumstances. All you need to know is what they need. That's it. So I want you to ask a question, how can I pray for you? Whatever the need is, felt need, not, it's not ours to judge, whatever that is, I want you to go to God and pray for that, just quickly. And then, guess what's going to happen? It's going to switch. The person that prayed is now going to say, hey, man, this, if you could just pray for, um, I just got some sickness in my family. It can be that vague. I've just been really struggling lately. It could be that. It could be, you know, I'm just happy. I just want to praise God. I just want to thank him for all the joys in my life. It could be that too. But we are required to do this, church. We are required to do this. We, not only do we pray for our leadership, we pray for our church, we pray for those people in power, we pray for that, but we're required to do this. So let's take a moment and do that uh, right now. So find a partner. I'll give you 10 seconds. Ready? One, two, three, go. 10, 9, 8. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is spiritual warfare that you're partaking in in this moment. Paul describes it as warfare. Listen, the gates of hell shudder when Christians come together and they bear one another's burdens when they praise each other and they celebrate the things that are worth celebrating. May this be a place that you come and be equipped to engage in this type of battle. Sharpen your swords by reading God's word. Don his armor. Remind yourself to wear the belt and the breastplate. And be steadfast with your shoes because you know the truth of the gospel. You know how this ends. Take up the shield and the sword and band together. And the world will change one heart at a time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to gather here. Father, we are ready to engage in spiritual warfare. Thank you for the illumination knowing that this is how we fight. We fight these battles on our knees. We follow you into the uh, uh, battles and you go before us. We're strengthened and comforted in that. Give us the strength to be in your army. Give us the courage to withstand and bring somebody into our life this week that doesn't yet know what you've already done for them. In Jesus' name we ask these things and the entire church said, amen. Go in peace.